This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to inquire how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. Chapter twenty two. The Thorns of Ullathorne. On the following Sunday, Mr. Arabin was to read himself in at his new church. It was agreed at the rectory that the archdeacon should go over with him and assist at the reading desk, and that Mr. Harding should take the archdeacon's duty at Plumstead Church. Mrs. Grantly had her school and her buns to attend to, and professed that she could not be spared, but Mrs. Bold was to accompany them. It was further agreed also that they would lunch at the squire's house, and return home after the afternoon service. Wilfred Thorne, Esquire, of Ullathorne, was the squire of St. Ewold's, or rather the squire of Ullathorne, for the domain of the modern landlord was of wider notoriety than the fame of the ancient saint. He was a fair specimen of what that race has come to in our days, which a century ago was, as we are told, fairly represented by Squire Weston. If that representation be a true one, few classes of men can have made faster strides in improvement. Mr. Thorne, however, was a man possessed of a quite sufficient number of foibles to lay him open to much ridicule. He was still a bachelor, being about fifty, and was not a little proud of his person. When living at home at Ullathorne, there was not much room for such pride, and there, therefore, he always looked like a gentleman, and like that which he certainly was, the first man in his parish. But during the month or six weeks which he annually spent in London, he tried so hard to look like a great man there also, which he certainly was not, that he was put down as a fool by many at his club. He was a man of considerable literary attainment in a certain way, and on certain subjects. His favourite authors were Montaigne and Burton, and he knew perhaps more than any other man in his own county, and the next to it, of the English essayists of the last two centuries. He possessed complete sets of The Idler, The Spectator, The Tattler, The Guardian, and The Rambler, and would discourse by hours together on the superiority of such publications to anything which has since been produced in all our Edinburghs and quarterlies. He was a great proficient in all questions of genealogy, and knew enough of almost every gentleman's family in England to say of what blood and lineage were descended all those who had any claim to be considered as possessors of any such luxuries. For blood and lineage he himself had a most profound respect. He counted back his own ancestors to some period long antecedent to the conquest, and could tell you, if you would listen to him, how it had come to pass that they, like Cedric the Saxon, had been permitted to hold their own among the Norman barons. It was not, according to his showing, on account of any weak complacence on the part of his family towards their Norman neighbours. Some Eolfried of Ullathorne once fortified his own castle, and held out. Not only that, but the then existing cathedral of Barchester also, against one Geoffrey de Burr, in the time of King John. And Mr. Thorne possessed the whole history of the siege written on vellum, and illuminated in a most costly manner. It little signified that no one could read the writing, as had that been possible no one could have understood the language. Mr. Thorne could, however, give you all the particulars in good English, and had no objection to do so. It would be unjust to say that he looked down on men whose families were of recent date. He did not do so. He frequently consorted with such, and had chosen many of his friends from among them. But he looked on them as great millionaires are apt to look on those who have small incomes, as men who have Sophocles at their fingers' ends regard those who know nothing of Greek. They might doubtless be good sort of people, entitled to much praise for virtue, very admirable for talent, highly respectable in every way, but they were without the one great good gift. Such was Mr. Thorne's way of thinking on the matter. Nothing could atone for the loss of good blood, nothing could neutralise its good effects. Few indeed were now possessed of it, but the possession was on that account the more precious. It was very pleasant to hear Mr. Thorne descant on this matter. Were you in your ignorance to surmise that such a one was of good family, because the head of his family was a baronet of an old date, 
he would open his eyes with a delightful look of affected surprise, and modestly remind you that baronetcy is only dated from James I. He would gently sigh if you spoke of the blood of the Fitzgeralds and de Burrs, would hardly allow the claims of the Howards and the Lowthers, and has before now alluded to the Talbots as a family who had hardly yet achieved the full honours of a pedigree. In speaking once of a widespread race whose name had received the honours of three coronets, scions from which sat for various constituencies, some one of whose members had been in almost every cabinet formed during the present century, a brilliant race such as there are few in England, Mr. Thorne had called them all dirt. He had not intended any disrespect to these men. He admired them in many senses, and allowed them their privileges without envy. He had merely meant to express his feeling that the streams which ran through their veins were not yet purified by time to that perfection, had not become so genuine an ichor as to be worthy of being called blood in the genealogical sense. When Mr. Arabin was first introduced to him, Mr. Thorne had immediately suggested that he was one of the Arabins of Uphill Stanton. Mr. Arabin replied that he was a very distant relative of the family alluded to. To this Mr. Thorne surmised that the relationship could not be very distant. Mr. Arabin assured him that it was so distant that the families knew nothing of each other. Mr. Thorne laughed his gentle laugh at this, and told Mr. Arabin that there was now existing no branch of his family separated from the parent stock at an earlier date than the reign of Elizabeth, and that therefore Mr. Arabin could not call himself distant. Mr. Arabin himself was quite clearly an Arabin of Uphill Stanton. "'But,' said the vicar, "'Uphill Stanton has been sold to the de Greys, and has been in their hands for the last fifty years.' "'And when it has been there one hundred and fifty, if it unluckily remains there so long,' said Mr. Thorne, "'your descendants will not be a whit less entitled to describe themselves as being of the family of Uphill Stanton. Thank God no de Grey can buy that, and thank God no Arabin and no Thorne can sell it.' In politics Mr. Thorne was an unflinching conservative— he looked on those fifty-three Trojans who, as Mr. Dodd tells us, censured free trade in November 1852, as the only patriots left among the public men of England. When that terrible crisis of free trade had arrived, when the repeal of the Corn Laws was carried by those very men whom Mr. Thorne had hitherto regarded as the only possible saviours of his country, he was for a time paralysed. His country was lost. But that was comparatively a small thing— other countries had flourished and fallen, and the human race still went on improving under God's providence. But now all trust in human faith must be for ever at an end. Not only must ruin come, but it must come through the apostasy of those who had been regarded as the truest of true believers. Politics in England, as a pursuit for gentlemen, must be at an end. Had Mr. Thorne been trodden underfoot by a Whig, he could have borne it as a Tory and a martyr but to be so utterly thrown over and deceived, by those he had so earnestly supported, so thoroughly trusted, was more than he could endure and live. He therefore ceased to live as a politician, and refused to hold any converse with the world at large on the state of the country. Such were Mr. Thorne's impressions for the first two or three years after Sir Robert Peel's apostasy, but by degrees his temper, as did that of others, cooled down. He began once more to move about, to frequent the bench and the market, and to be seen at dinners, shoulder to shoulder, with some of those who had so cruelly betrayed him. It was a necessity for him to live, and that plan of his for avoiding the world did not answer. He, however, and others around him who still maintained the same staunch principles of protection, men like himself who were too true to flinch at the cry of a mob, had their own way of consoling themselves. They were, and felt themselves to be, the only true depositories left of certain Eleusinian mysteries, of certain deep and wondrous services of worship, by which alone the gods could be rightly approached. To them, and them only, it was now given to know these things, and to perpetuate them, if that might still be done, by the careful and secret education of their children. 
We have read how private and peculiar forms of worship have been carried on from age to age in families which to the outer world have apparently adhered to the services of some ordinary church. And so by degrees it was with Mr. Thorne. He learnt at length to listen calmly while protection was talked of as a thing dead, although he knew within himself that it was still quick with a mystic life. Nor was he without a certain pleasure that such knowledge, though given to him, should be debarred from the multitude. He became accustomed to hear, even among country gentlemen, that free trade was after all not so bad, and to hear this without dispute, although conscious within himself that everything good in England had gone with his old palladium. He had within him something of the feeling of Cato, who gloried that he could kill himself because Romans were no longer worthy of their name. Mr. Thorne had no thought of killing himself, being a Christian and still possessing his four thousand a year, but the feeling was not on that account the less comfortable. Mr. Thorne was a sportsman, and had been active, though not outrageous, in his sports. Previous to the great downfall of politics in his county, he had supported the hunt by every means in his power. He had preserved game till no goose or turkey could show a tail in the parish of St. Ewold's. He had planted gorse covers with more care than oaks and larches. He had been more anxious for the comfort of his foxes than of his ewes and lambs. No meat had been more popular than at Ullathorne. No man's stables had been more liberally open to the horses of distant men than Mr. Thorne's. No man had said more, written more, or done more to keep the club up. The theory of protection could expand itself so thoroughly in the practices of a county hunt. But when the great ruin came, when the noble master of the Barsetshire hounds supported the recreant minister in the House of Lords, and basely surrendered his truth, his manhood, his friends, and his honour for the hope of a garter, then Mr. Thorne gave up the hunt. He did not cut his covers, for that would have not been the act of a gentleman. He did not kill his foxes, for that, according to his light, would have been murder. He did not say that his covers should not be drawn, or his earth stopped, for that would have been illegal, according to the by-laws prevailing among country gentlemen. But he absented himself from home on the occasion of every meet at Ullathorne, left the covers to their fate, and could not be persuaded to take his pink coat out of his press, or his hunters out of his stable. This lasted for two years and then by degrees he came round. He first appeared at a neighbouring meet on a pony, dressed in his shooting-coat, as though he had trotted in by accident. Then he walked up one morning on foot to see his favourite gorse drawn, and when his groom brought his mare out by chance, he did not refuse to mount her. He was next persuaded by one of the immortal fifty-three to bring his hunting materials over to the other side of the county, and take a fortnight with the hounds there, and so gradually he returned to his old life. But in hunting, as in other things, he was only supported by an inward feeling of mystic superiority to those with whom he shared the common breath of outer life. Mr. Thorne did not live in solitude at Ullathorne. He had a sister who was ten years older than himself, and who participated in his prejudices and feelings so strongly that she was a living caricature of all his foibles. She would not open a modern quarterly, did not choose to see a magazine in her drawing-room, and would not have polluted her fingers with a shred of the times for any consideration. She spoke of Addison, Swift, and Steele as though they were still living, regarded Defoe as the best-known novelist of his country and thought of Fielding as a young but meritorious novice in the fields of romance. In poetry she was familiar with names as late as Dryden, and had once been seduced into reading The Rape of the Lock, but she regarded Spencer as the purest type of her country's literature in this line. Genealogy was her favourite insanity. Those things which are the pride of most genealogists were to her contemptible. Arms and mottoes set her beside herself— the old Freed of Ullathorne had wanted no motto to assist him in cleaving to the brisket Geoffrey de Burr, and Eel Freed's great-grandfather, the gigantic Ullafrid, had required no other arms than those which nature gave him to hurl from the top of his own castle, a cousin of the base invading Norman. To her all modern English names were equally insignificant. 
Hengist, Horsa, and such like, had for her ears the only true savour of nobility. She was not contented unless she could go beyond the Saxons, and would certainly have christened all her children, had she had children, by the names of the ancient Britons. In some respects she was not unlike Scots Ulrica, and had she been given to cursing, she would certainly have done so in the names of Mr. Scogula and Zernibok. Not having submitted to the embraces of any polluting Norman, as poor Ulrica had done, and having assisted no parricide, the milk of human kindness had not curdled in her bosom. She never cursed, therefore, but blessed rather. This, however, she did in a strange, uncouth Saxon manner, that would have been unintelligible to any peasants but her own. As a politician, Miss Thorne had been so thoroughly disgusted with public life by the base deeds long antecedent to the Cornwall question, that that had but little moved her. In her estimation her brother had been a fast young man, hurried away by a too ardent temperament into democratic tendencies. Now happily he was brought to sounder views by seeing the iniquity of the world. She had not yet reconciled herself to the Reform Bill, and still groaned in spirit over the defalcations of the Duke as touching the Catholic emancipation. If asked whom she thought the Queen should take as her counsellor, she would probably have named Lord Eldon, and when reminded that that venerable man was no longer present in the flesh to assist us, she would probably have answered with a sigh, that none now could help us but the dead. In religion Miss Thorne was a pure druidess, we would not have it understood by that that she did actually in these latter days assist at any human sacrifices, or that she was in fact hostile to the Church of Christ. She had adopted the Christian religion as a milder form of the worship of her ancestors, and always appealed to her doing so as evidence that she had no prejudices against reform, when it could be shown that reform was salutary. This reform was the most modern of any to which she had as yet acceded, it being presumed that British ladies had given up their paint, and taken to some sort of petticoats before the days of St. Augustine. That further feminine step in advance, which combines paint and petticoats together, had not found a votary in Miss Thorne. But she was a druidess in this, that she regretted she knew not what in the usages and practices of her church. She sometimes talked, and constantly thought of good things gone by, though she had but the faintest idea of what those good things had been. She imagined that a purity had existed, which was now gone, that a piety had adorned our pastors and a simple docility our people, for which it may be feared history gave her but little true warrant. She was accustomed to speak of Cranmer, as though he had been the firmest and most simple-minded of martyrs, and of Elizabeth, as though the pure Protestant faith of her people had been the one anxiety of her life. It would have been cruel to undeceive her, had it been possible, but it would have been impossible to make her believe that the one was a time-serving priest, willing to go to any length to keep his place, and that the other was at heart a papist, with this sole proviso, that she should be her own pope. And so Miss Thorne went on, sighing and regretting, looking back to the divine right of kings as the ruling axiom of a golden age, and cherishing, low down in the bottom of her heart of hearts, a dear, unmentioned wish for the restoration of some exiled Stuart. Who would deny her the luxury of her sighs, or the sweetness of her soft regrets? In her person and her dress she was perfect, and well she knew her own perfection. She was a small, elegantly made old woman, with a face from which the glow of her youth had not departed without leaving some streaks of a roseate hue. She was proud of her colour, proud of her grey hair, which she wore in short, crisp curls, peering out all round her face from her dainty white lace cap. To think of all the money that she spent in lace used to break the heart of poor Mrs. Quiverful with her seven daughters. She was proud of her teeth, which were still white and numerous, proud of her bright, cheery eye, proud of her short, jaunty step, and very proud of the neat, precise small feet with which those steps were taken. She was proud also, ay, very proud, of the rich brocaded silk in which it was her custom to ruffle through her drawing-room. We know what was the custom of the Lady of Branksome. Nine and twenty knights of fame hung their shield in Branksome Hall. The Lady of Ullathorne was not so martial in her habits. 
but hardly less costly. She might have boasted that nine-and-twenty silken skirts might have been produced in her chamber, each fit to stand alone. The nine-and-twenty shields of the Scottish heroes were less independent, and hardly more potent to withstand any attack that might be made on them. Miss Thorne, when fully dressed, might be said to have been armed cap a pie, and she was always fully dressed, as far as was ever known to mortal man. For all this rich attire, Miss Thorne was not indebted to the generosity of her brother. She had a very comfortable independence of her own, which she divided among juvenile relatives, the milliners, and the poor, giving much the largest share to the latter. It may be imagined, therefore, that with all her little follies she was not unpopular. All her follies have, we believe, been told. Her virtues were too numerous to describe, and not sufficiently interesting to deserve description. While we are on the subject of the Thorns, one word must be said of the house they lived in. It was not a large house, nor a fine house, nor perhaps to modern ideas a very commodious house, but by those who love the peculiar colour and peculiar ornaments of genuine Tudor architecture, it was considered a perfect gem. We beg to own ourselves among the number, and therefore take this opportunity to express our surprise that so little is known by English men and women of the beauties of English architecture. The ruins of the Colosseum, the Campanile at Florence, St. Mark's, Cologne, the Bourse, and Notre Dame are with our tourists as familiar as household words, but they know nothing of the glories of Wiltshire, Dorsetshire, and Somersetshire. Nay, we much question whether many noted travellers, men who have pitched their tents perhaps under Mount Sinai, are not still ignorant that there are glories in Wiltshire, Dorsetshire, and Somersetshire. We beg that they will go and see. Mr. Thorne's house was called Ullathorne Court, and was properly so called, for the house itself formed two sides of a quadrangle, which was completed on the other two sides by a wall about twenty feet high. This wall was built of cut stone, rudely cut indeed, and now much worn, but of a beautiful, rich, tawny yellow colour the effect of that stone crop of minute growth, which it had taken three centuries to produce. The top of this wall was ornamented by huge round stone balls of the same colour as the wall itself. Entrance into the court was had through a pair of iron gates, so massive that no one could comfortably open or close them. Consequently, they were rarely disturbed. From the gateway, two paths led obliquely across the court, that to the left reaching the hall door, which was in the corner made by the angle of the house, and that to the right leading to the back entrance, which was at the further end of the longer portion of the building. With those who are now adepts at contriving house accommodation, it will militate much against Ullathorne Court that no carriage could be brought to the hall door. If you enter Ullathorne at all, you must do so, fair reader, on foot, or at least in a bath-chair. No vehicle drawn by horses ever comes within that iron gate. But this is nothing to the next horror that will encounter you. On entering the front door, which you do by no very grand portal, you find yourself immediately in the dining-room. "'What! No hall?' exclaims my luxurious friend, accustomed to all the comfortable appurtenances of modern life. "'Yes, kind sir, a noble hall, if you will but observe it.' a true old English hall of excellent dimensions for a country gentleman's family. But, if you please, no dining-parlour. Both Mr. and Miss Thorne were proud of this peculiarity of their dwelling, though the brother was once all but tempted by his friends to alter it. They delighted in the knowledge that they, like Cedric, positively dined in their true hall, even though they so dined tete-a-tete. But though they had never owned, they had felt and endeavoured to remedy the discomfort of such arrangement. A huge screen partitioned off the front door, and a portion of the hall, and from the angle so screened off a second door led into a passage which ran along the larger side of the house, next to the courtyard. Either my reader or I must be a bad hand at topography, if it be not clear that the great hall forms the ground floor of the smaller portion of the mansion that which was to your left as you entered the iron gate, and that it occupies the whole of this wing of the building. It must be equally clear that it looks out on a trim mown lawn, through three quadrangular windows with stone mullions, 
each window divided into a larger portion at the bottom and a smaller portion at the top, and each portion again divided into five by perpendicular stone supporters. There may be windows which give a better light than such as these, and it may be, as my utilitarian friend observes, that the giving of light is the desired object of a window. I will not argue the point with him. Indeed, I cannot. But I shall not the less die in the assured conviction that no sort or description of window is capable of imparting half so much happiness to mankind as that which had been adopted at Ullathorne Court. "'What, not an oriel?' says Miss Diana, the middle age. "'No, Miss Diana, not even an oriel. Beautiful as is an oriel window. It has not about it so perfect a feeling of quiet English homely comfort. Let oriel windows grace a college, or the half-public mansion of a potent peer, but for the sitting-room of quiet country ladies, of ordinary homely folk, nothing can equal the square mullioned windows of the Tudor architects. The hall was hung round, with family female insipidities by Lely, and unprepossessing male thorns in red coats by Nella, each thorn having been let into a panel in the wainscoting, in the proper manner. At the further end of the room was a huge fireplace, which afforded much ground of difference between the brother and sister. An antiquated grate that would hold about a hundred weight of coal had been stuck on to the hearth by Mr. Thorne's father. This hearth had, of course, been intended for the consumption of wood faggots, and the iron dogs for the purpose were still standing, though half buried in the masonry of the grate. Miss Thorne was very anxious to revert to the dogs. The dear good old creature was always glad to revert to anything, and had she been systematically indulged, would doubtless in time have reflected that fingers were made before forks, and have reverted accordingly. But in the affairs of the fireplace Mr. Thorne would not revert. Country gentlemen around him all had comfortable grates in their dining-rooms. He was not exactly the man to have suggested a modern usage, but he was not so far prejudiced as to banish those which his father had prepared for his use. Mr. Thorne had, indeed, once suggested that with very little contrivance the front door might have been altered, so as to open at least into the passage. But on hearing this, his sister Monica, such was Miss Thorne's name, had been taken ill, and had remained so for a week. Before she came downstairs, she received a pledge from her brother that the entrance should never be changed in her lifetime. At the end of the hall, opposite to the fireplace, a door led into the drawing-room, which was of equal size, and lighted with precisely similar windows. But yet the aspect of the room was very different. It was papered, and the ceiling, which in the hall showed the old rafters, was whitened and finished with a modern cornice. Miss Thorne's drawing-room, or, as she always called it, withdrawing-room, was a beautiful apartment. The windows opened on to the full extent of the lovely trim garden. Immediately before the windows were plots of flowers in stiff, stately, stubborn little beds, each bed surrounded by a stone coping of its own. Beyond there was a low parapet wall on which stood urns and images, fauns, nymphs, satyrs, and a whole tribe of Pan's followers. And then again, beyond that, a beautiful lawn sloped away to a sunk fence, which divided the garden from the park. Mr. Thorne's study was at the end of the drawing-room, and beyond that were the kitchen and the offices. Doors opened into both Miss Thorne's withdrawing-room and Mr. Thorne's sanctum from the passage above alluded to, which, as it came to the latter room, widened itself so as to make space for the huge black oak stairs, which led to the upper regions. Such was the interior of Ullathorne Court. But having thus described it, perhaps somewhat too tediously, we beg to say that it is not the interior to which we wish to call the English tourist's attention, though we advise him to lose no legitimate opportunity of becoming acquainted with it in a friendly manner. It is the outside of Ullathorne that is so lovely. Let the tourist get admission at least into the garden and fling himself on that soft sward just opposite the exterior angle of the house. He will there get the double frontage, and enjoy that which is so lovely, the expanse of architectural beauty, without the formal dullness of one long line. It is the colour of Ullathorne that is so remarkable. It is all of that delicious tawny hue which no stone can give, unless it has on it the vegetable richness of centuries.' 
Strike the wall with your hand, and you will think that the stone has on it no covering, but rub it carefully, and you will find that the colour comes off upon your finger. No colourist has ever yet worked from a palette that has been able to come up to this rich colouring of years crowding themselves on years. Ullathorne is a high building for a country house, for it possesses three stories, and in each story the windows are of the same sort as that described, though varying in size, and varying also in their lines athwart the house. Those of the ground floor are all uniform in size and position but those above are irregular both in size and place, and this irregularity gives a bizarre and not unpicturesque appearance to the building. Along the top, on every side, runs a low parapet, which nearly hides the roof, and at the corners are more figures of fawns and satyrs. Such is Ullathorne House, but we must say one word of the approach to it, which shall include all the description which we mean to give of the church also. The picturesque old church of St. Ewald's stands immediately opposite to the iron gates which open into the court, and is all but surrounded by the branches of the lime-trees which form the avenue leading up to the house from both sides. This avenue is magnificent, but it would lose much of its value in the eyes of many proprietors by the fact that the road through it is not private property. It is a public lane between hedgerows, with a broad grass margin on either side of the road from which the lime-trees spring. Ullathorne Court, therefore, does not stand absolutely surrounded by its own grounds, though Mr. Thorne is owner of all the adjacent land. This, however, is the source of very little annoyance to him. Men, when they are acquiring property, think much of such things, but they who live where their ancestors have lived for years do not feel the misfortune. It never occurred either to Mr. or Miss Thorne that they were not sufficiently private, because the world at large might, if it so wished, walk or drive by their iron gates. That part of the world which availed itself of the privilege was, however, very small. Such, a year or two since, were the Thorns of Ullathorne. Such, we believe, are the inhabitants of many an English country home. May it be long before their number diminishes. End of chapter 22